that the, that the revitalization project isn't going to happen without public private partnerships for infrastructure, along with, with uh, Jerry and TIF dollars up there uh, for the city to be able to, to invest in that type of thing. Okay. Uh, great. So we, we talked a little bit about uh, what, what needs work. What do you think Huber Heights is doing right now that is positive and that is moving in the right direction? I think a lot of things right now, I think our citizens feel have kind of stagnated. But I look, I look back at kind of some of the projects that happened over the, over the last few years. You know, I think the Rose has been a phenomenal success uh, here in Huber Heights. I think it's um, put us on the map in, in a different way. I've attended concerts there. I've talked to people. There are people coming to that that venue from all over Ohio, mm -hmm. from all over the country. And you talk to people from Texas, from Florida. I talk to people from Utah. Uh, there are people that are coming here from all over the place. I think that's been a great venue, and I think that is working well. And we can, you know, if you have more questions about that, we can, we can get into that. Yeah. I think the Aquatic Center has been success. I mean, I know, you know, when I grew up, you know, my, my dad was a, was a union riffer. My mom was a, was a housewife. And we didn't have a ton of money. But my neighbor, you know, I lived right down almost where Tilbury crosses Harshenville, and the old YMCA used to be there at the dead end of Harshenville, kind of by oh, yeah. uh, Moorfield. I used to ride my bike so, there all the time. Yeah, we, we didn't have, um, we didn't have the money. I didn't have, I didn't have a Y pass. We didn't have a family pass to the Y. So if I wanted to go swimming, I always had to make sure that it was a day that my neighbor wanted to go. And uh, I went with Gary to the Y on, on their family pass, so at least as a guest. So the fact that we have an amenity here in the city now, this aquatic center that anybody can go to for a couple bucks, um, I think is a good thing. And, you know, I know there's been a lot of people upset about money and again with tip dollars and the amount of money to pay for the land there and what's that cost but it kind of comes down to a lot of things that people just aren't aware of the bonds that was used to purchase or the you know to, for the loans for the aquatic center we borrowed those on those build america bonds and if you remember when that was going on when, um, when mr Allen was president right. um saw the shovel ready projects and all these things where they the federal government offered these bonds called build america bonds so Every year, we actually get rebates from the federal government back into the city from those Build America bonds, and that money is not even calculated in the p &L statements every year when we analyze, you know, what the annual revenue was for the Aquatic Center. So it's just making people aware and understand that we do have good things happening in the city here, that not everything is bad, not everything is negative. I think over the last few years, we've had a lot of people and kind of the sentiment in the city has been people pulling back, people um, looking at things with kind of a half, you know, glass half empty kind of attitude. And part of my vision is no, think bigger. We can do good and big things, and we can do them in a financially smart and responsible way. And I think the Aquatic Center was one. And so the Rose, the Aquatic Center, I think those are, are good things that the city has done. Um, I, I don't, you know, the city has gone on this uh, the cell tower issue. I think that's, that has been a lot in, in the news lately. Um, I think the city did a great thing by voting that down in unison. That's a strong signal to the FCC and the federal judge who look at this particular case and know that our city leaders and our city government is fully behind our property owners and our residents. And I hope for a fantastic outcome there that the, the judge will will rule that there are some rights of the, of the residents that are being kind of, kind of trumped on there. Yeah, we can so, hope hope for that, definitely, because uh, yeah, I'm I with you. I, and I think the city, I think the city coming together in that vote, I think that really does show that there are, that the people that we have on our city council right now do know that, you know, what, what right is right and wrong is wrong and can be unified around a, a good issue. And I think that's really important, the vote that was taken uh, last night at that special meeting. I think that was important, and I think that's going to be important moving forward. Regardless of who becomes the mayor, council has to realize that by working together and compromising, 
the city moves forward, regardless of who is, is the mayor. Council has to work together. They do, and and they have to, you know, I'm glad they voted the way they did because it is the 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 property rights of the people that's most important in in that case. That's the way I see it. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a uh, physicist like uh, the fellow who owns the land, but it it was you know it, it was it was a good vote and uh, it was a unanimous vote. I congratulate them on yeah, that. It's it's one of those things where to me you look at something like that and you say, okay, I'm I'm the kind of person that believes that you know freedom is a good thing and I should be able to have the freedom to do the things that I want to do, but somewhere a line has to be drawn, or I believe it is drawn in our constitution that says. Yeah, I can do what I want to do as long as my freedom or what I do doesn't infringe upon the rights of somebody else. I think that's where the line has to be drawn. And clearly in this case, I think what the uh, what the church was doing was infringing upon the property rights of their neighbor. And, I, just, you know, again, I just don't think – I just didn't feel good about that. I just think that was wrong. Excellent. Um, now, we, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, – just a little bit, and we'll, we'll get back into that, but – uh, the controversial things that happen within the city. And sometimes we see council members on social media. How do you feel um, social media should be used? Or how would you, if elected mayor, how would you use social media? Um, or how would you want the city officials to use social media? I guess a two-parter there. Sure. I am I'm not a fan of taking away the right of any city council member from using social media in a positive manner to communicate with the residents in their particular ward or as in the at-large um, council members to be able to communicate with, with the rest of the city. And I don't want to limit myself to be able to communicate with the residents of the city. So I do think that social media has added a level of transparency. I think it's okay and it's good. I think I think what's happened though is social media has been used to be personal now, and yeah. you know what I would like to see is that every Brown Council still has a kind of a government social media page, so to speak, and when they speak to the residents, they they use their you know human rights. Um, Ward page to be able to make those communications. Then, when they're on social media and they're communicating with their families and they're showing pictures of kids and grandkids and, you know, at the games and the events they go to and things like that, then I think, well, in the personal pages, you know, is good for that part because they, they can be personal Facebook and they can have their, their public Facebook. But ultimately, everybody on council has to be an adult. And understand that the things they do and the things they say don't just affect them. It affects, as a public figure, it affects everybody. What they say and how they say it affects the overall image of the city. And, you know, we have these wonderful public forums on Facebook, and there's probably six or seven different forums about Hebrew hacks that people can post on and share things with. Mm-hmm. But not everybody on those forums lives in Hebrew Heights. There are media personnel, uh, writers, camera people from different media outlets who are on these pages just waiting for the next thing to blow up in Hebrew Heights so they can jump on it and make a story out of it. Right. And I think, I think we just have to have more responsible use of social media. Companies all across this country have social media policies for their employees because they don't want their employees doing anything that would reflect or be detrimental to the company that they represent. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that um, from a city council perspective, because I think people can use it responsibly. We've seen examples of that happen, and I think it can be used irresponsibly. I think we've seen examples of that as well. So uh, do you think what the, council is going to have to do is yeah. agree. Council is going to have to agree on kind of their own self-regulation on how they continue to use social media. Do you think the uh, city itself, the city page, should be more active, or do you think they're doing enough? I mean, maybe, uh, I guess, take control of the narrative that's being put out there. Maybe the city could 
could uh, u- utilize their pages a little more often. Do you do you feel that they could, or, or so you, you think mean, it's okay? You mean like the actual the internet page, or like a social yeah. media Facebook? Like their uh, Facebook page. I, I think a lot of people um, aren't really they're going to the the website for different things, but I think a lot of people that are connected to social media really pay attention to that. Um, right. So. Well, I, I clearly think that the, you know, you know look, we, we just got to have a lot of stuff to feel, to feel good about. It doesn't feel good to, you know, you got to have something to talk about to be able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And um, I think right now they just, there, there hasn't been a ton of things in a positive light to be talking about. And then we have a lot of people who, um, you know, nobody likes to put themselves out there. And if you give a form for people to um, to be negative sometimes, they're going to do that. So I think we've got to we've got to make sure that we are branding our message and our image at the city and the community. And as long as that always is in a positive light, then absolutely that could be marketed on social media pages and in an area to make people aware of all the things that are the, the things that are going on. So yeah, I think you can always look at kind of what you're doing to market yourself. And, 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 and quite frankly, that is my, my background is a lot of sales and marketing. And um, certainly something I would be interested to look at to know how we market ourselves better. I mean, that's, again, that kind of goes back to one of the whole reasons I'm running. How do we change our image in this region and brand ourselves to where we're not this, um, you this, when I hear people call us Huber Tucky and, Things like that. I mean, it yeah. literally makes my skin crawl. It drives me crazy, and I want to change that image. So, if we can use a social media page to do that, to help rebrand, then absolutely, let's use all the tools in our in our toolbox. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I'm gonna move on to some some of the current events and, and maybe get your take on on that. Um, the last podcast I had, and we talked about the issue with the uh, residency requirement for the city manager. As you know, um, and as those who are listening may know, uh, in last November, the residents voted to keep the language in the charter that requires the city manager to live within the city of Huber Heights or within six months. Now, that's been going on almost a year now. Council hasn't touched it. What are your thoughts on that that issue? I think that was the language that happened this past May. I think, that, I think some of that ballot language for the charter was in, was in May on the primary ballot. Um, but understand, I mean, timing either, either way. I don't think it's been uh, going on since November. I think it's been since May. But, uh, well, the language for the city manager was November. It wasn't for May. There was there was other charter amendment language in, in May, but this specific one with the city manager was November during the uh, presidential election as well. Okay. I mean, I, I, the only reason I'm, I'm kind of going off of memories, I thought I was at uh, a couple of meetings where a lot of those charter amendments were. They were. Uh, were You're right. Um, there there were amendments last November, and there were some in May. There was a lot of them, yeah. and that, I think, is. Um, but we had some discussions. I know one I attended at the senior center. Yeah. We had discussions leading up to that May primary about what that residency requirement bent, meant. So I just was I was just remembering that language being back on the on the main ballot. But yes, council's way, been discussing this for even past the yes. vote to f- try and figure out what to do and how to go about doing it. That's not going, <laughs> not going to, uh, I don't know, anger the residents and not going to sure. anger. Yeah. So there, there's absolutely no doubt that this is a very controversial issue and. I understand 100 percent the the tone of the residents who believe that the city manager should live in the city, and I think that there are so so I think that the word should and the word must are very closely related, um, but I think they are somewhat different. Okay. So if someone asks me, should the city manager live in Huber Heights? Absolutely. Right, hundred percent. City manager should live in the city that they manage. 
must the city manager. 